Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. Welcome to Growers Daily, your daily dose of ecological farming insight. It is Monday, October 28th, 2024, and on the show today we are going to discuss putting beds to bed for the winter, which I probably could reword that one, but I'm not going to. We're going to talk about what we may be getting wrong about mycorrhizal fungi, and AI tells us two different things about how we should farm. So let's do it. Or not. It's up to you, AI. All right, so I hope everyone had a restful or productive or profitable weekend. Once again, mine was just basically one giant soccer match. I coached, I watched, I played, I coached some more, lots of soccer and lots of reading nerdy research papers as well. Just ain't no party like a Farmer Jesse party, as they say. So I uh, mentioned last week that I wanted to dedicate a segment to putting garden beds to sleep for the winter. So let's do that today. Now, it's basically November, so for most of you, in America at least, putting your beds to rest for the winter is pretty much taken care of at this point, I would assume, but maybe not, and there are ways to do it that both prepare those beds for the spring, but also protect the soil and perhaps even enrich it a little bit. So let's go through some of how I approach this. First, and this feels like a bit of a PSA, but don't just throw cover crop seed out there in your garden beds that are empty right now. I'm serious. Unless you like planting your own weeds, which... I don't judge, but you will have to think thoughtfully about how you employ living plants over the winter. Whatever you sow now will not be ready to terminate without tillage before late spring. And fair warning, uh, tarping can work some magic in the summer, but tarps do not work very well early on in the season. So if you need those beds early in the spring and don't want to have that large tillage event to kind of get them ready, then you would probably want to avoid sowing cover crops. If you don't need those beds until the late spring, uh, which for us would be like mid to late May or early June, then you can go for it. So as many cover crops as you can. Some of this will be a bit repetitive to the beginning of Friday's episode, but some of it will be additional. So anyway, what you can sow this late in the season here in Kentucky, at least, is crimson clover, rye, vetch, Austrian winter pea, field peas, winter wheat, and to some extent mustard or kale, along with lacy phacelia and cilantro. It does not have to be all of those, but whatever you sow, make sure to include a legume or three. Those are where you are going to see the most crop response in your cash crop after the legumes have died and release the nitrogen they have sequestered. The grains are often far more for their mulching ability and weed suppression ability. If you do not want that mulch, which to be clear may be the case in some for some crops, uh, especially those that are directly sown, like if you want to sow carrots, you don't want a big, thick, grassy mulch in the way. So if you do not want that mulch, uh, then legumes are a lot easier to deal with in the spring, and you can forgo the grain crop like rye. Field peas are probably my one exception to the don't sow cover crops if you need the beds early rule. Like if I absolutely had to sow a cover crop right now in a bed that I had planned to use early in the spring, it would be peas because you can generally kill peas relatively easily in the spring with a very low mowing. And if that doesn't work, a very light surface tillage after the mowing. Watch any one of the many cover crop videos we've done for more technical guidance. I'll link the playlist in the show notes. Now, for those of you who don't want to have living plants in certain beds in, in the early spring, a nice weed-free mulch is a great option uh, for putting the beds to rest for the winter. Cooler colored mulches like straw will keep the soil cooler for longer into the spring. So you will have to take that into consideration in the spring. That soil will not warm up like exposed soil or like compost mulched beds. So crops may be slow into production. It's a big mistake a lot of new northern growers make. They use straw or hay a la Ruth Stout's method and then find that their soils never really warm up. Uh, in the south, that can be an advantage, like you can keep your soil for cooler for longer, which may be a great thing. But in the north or in cold climates, it can simply extend the winter. If you have access to a good but mulchy compost, uh, this would be a good time to use it, as it will slowly integrate with the native soil over the winter and then be nice for sowing or planting in the early spring without any preparation. Or like if you have really, really decomposed wood chips, this would also be a good opportunity to use those. The risks of not covering the soil are largely weeds and soil erosion, as well as soil organic matter loss, uh, but also a loss of microbial diversity, soil structure, soil nutrients, and more. So basically all of the risks. 
it's it's not great. So what about plastic mulch or tarps? Well, those should be kind of a last resort maybe, but if they will help keep bare soil in place until you can get plants and or mulch in there, uh, it's perhaps slightly better than bare fallow. If you can add a little mulch before the plastic, that would be preferred, even if just a thin layer of chopped up leaves that could at very least feed the soil until you're ready to plant in the spring. Remember, and I don't know how you could forget, because if you've been watching my channel for any amount of time or listening to my podcast, but like I always say, if the soil is not being fed, it is feeding on itself. So plants or natural mulches, if you can find some, are the ideal way to tuck in your gardens and simultaneously improve your soil for the spring. Again, loads of videos on our YouTube channel about mulches and cover cropping, so make sure you peruse if you have not before. All right, up next, let's get fungi. That's just, that one doesn't work at all, but anyway, BRB. Today's episode is brought to you by Rimmel Greenhouses. Whether it's tomatoes to market, flowers in the spring, or your family's harvest, growing in a greenhouse protected from the weather provides the right environment that you need for a harvest that you can count on. Rimmel greenhouses are designed for durability and offer the quality that you need to grow productively year-round. Visit RimmelGreenhouses.com to get a quote today. If I may editorialize for a second, I own a Rimmel tunnel. I love it. We built it ourselves, and I really appreciated the quality of the tunnel as well as the customer service we received in the process, so make sure to check them out. If you, the listener, are enjoying the show and want to support it, you can do so at patreon.com slash growers. I will try to get to questions from everywhere that questions come from, but I will always get to those Patreon questions. Today's question comes from Patreon member Bill Marshall, who writes, We know that mycorrhizal fungi don't form root zone relations with some species, but does the formation of soil aggregate, aggregates by said fungi still benefit these species? Okay, cool. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate the question. First, for the uninitiated, what the heck are mycorrhizal fungi? Well, these are a type of fungi that live in the soil and form symbiotic relationships with multiple plant species and may even share nutrients between those plants. Uh, they can extend the roots of plants, thus their namesake, myco meaning fungi, rhizal meaning roots. Anyway, they act like, I don't know, go-go gadget roots and help the plants gather nutrients and water from deeper or further into the soil. Plants can sometimes also utilize these connections to communicate the presence of diseases or pests to other plants on that same network, and the fungi may release chemicals that can help protect those plants, thus giving them, those plants with mycorrhizal associations, a competitive edge. Or you could just describe them as show-offs. That's, that's kind of what they are, mycorrhizal fungi are just show-offs. But what Bill is referring to in the question is that there are plants that are considered non-mycorrhizal uh, that we grow in gardens such as broccoli and the brassica family, um, as well as beets and spinach and much of the amaranth family. These are plants that are said to not make symbiotic associations with mycorrhizal fungi, except when they do. You see, uh, research over the last few years has shown some exceptions and also highlighted a lot about these below ground relationships that we don't fully understand yet, plus pointed out some simple historical errors that have ultimately added up to misconceptions about which plants do and don't make mycorrhizal associations and what that relationship is like. Uh, like it's not wrong, but it's just incomplete and the soil, surprise, surprise, is just really dynamic. Uh, one paper that surveyed the available research found, quote, some presence of AM fungal structures and DNA throughout plants in the brassicaceae. In other words, sometimes brassicas may not make associations, but also sometimes they might. And that paper gives at least a dozen species-specific examples of mycorrhizal fungi and brassica roots hanging out together, like some nerdy version of that show Cheaters. That paper is actually really fascinating and impossible to cover fully here, but talks about some of the misconceptions about these associations being super simple. Like, for instance, some of the papers they reviewed were only looking for one type of fungal structure and effectively may have missed others in the process. So basically, the research wasn't wrong per se, but the scope was perhaps too small to determine if the fun mycorrhizal fungi were present. Also, there are nerdy little zingers in this particular paper that made me laugh, like, and I'm going to summarize here a bit, uh, but like this one where they write of some of the research that they reviewed, uh, that quote, often there are instances of mycorrhizal fungi being found in the roots of non-mycorrhizal host plants, 
In a survey conducted in the field, one group dismissed potential evidence of mycorrhizal association within the Brassicaceae, seemingly for no other reason than its traditionally non-mycorrhizal status, despite irregular hyphal penetration in roots, which they refer to as presumably non-mycorrhizal without any further explanation, end quote. Boom. Take that, slackers. Great stuff. This paper says, as most papers do, more research is needed to understand these inconsistencies and why certain brassicas may have associations in one environment and not in another. Also, a paper published earlier this summer showed mycorrhizal hyphae uh, could penetrate or colonize roots of non-host plants without forming typical mycorrhizal structures. Does that mean the brassica or non-host plant is benefiting? No, not necessarily. Sometimes it may be more of a parasitization, but there is just a lot we still don't fully understand about this dynamic fungi and its relationships to certain plants. There are studies that have demonstrated benefits to several non-mycorrhizal plants, such as spinach, broccoli, and certain radishes through the addition of mycorrhizal fungi. Of course, there are also studies that show inhibition from the presence of these fungi on non-host and non-associating plants. So clear as mud, right? Perfect. Anyway, I'm by no means an expert on these fungi, but I do want to make sure to actually at least kind of answer your question there, Bill, uh, as best that I can, specifically the part about the formation of soil aggregates by these fungi benefiting other crops that may not associate directly with them. Soil aggregates are good for the soil across the board, and mycorrhizae are supremely good at creating them. These aggregates store food for microbes, which eventually become nutrients for plants. They provide habitat. They create soil structure and hold the soil particles in place. Water, you may have heard of it, is of particular importance. Uh, so soil aggregates rule at managing water, both in times of excess and times of expletives. Sorry, I meant to say drought there. Actually, I kind of did say drought. Anyway, you want a lot of soil aggregation. So in effect, if following a host plant, Non-host plants, if that even is their real name, can theoretically still benefit from the activity of mycorrhizal fungi later on, even if they do not directly benefit from the relationship themselves. Soil aggregates for the win, always. Anyway, let me know what you think, and thanks for the fun question, Bill. Appreciate that. Patreon members, feel free to hit up the that October show thread and get more questions in. I answer five a week, so don't be shy. It's a lot of questions. Up next, we messy up our messy Monday. Be right back. Hey everyone, this is Clara Coleman, and I just wanted to pop in here real quick and say that if you're enjoying this show, you may also enjoy my own show, The Winter Growers Podcast. I interview growers from all over the world about how they produce year round, especially through the winter months. We talk about the infrastructure, the mental and physical challenges, the tips and tricks, and I even include a thought provoking lightning round of questions at the end of each conversation. You can subscribe to the Winter Growers Podcast wherever you get podcasts or subscribe to the No-Till Growers Network on your favorite podcast platform. Thanks for letting me jump in and I look forward to seeing you there. Now back to your regularly scheduled programming. Okay, so I'm going to take Messy Monday in a slightly different direction today because I want to close today's episode with a quick note on Messy AI searches and farming. Google has started to use an AI model to answer Google questions. I mean, there's a lot to really dislike about AI, and it's an absolutely wild new frontier of copyright and name, image, and likeness infringement. But on the surface, with these AI search results on Google, I'm mostly good with the format and even the way the answers are presented with the citations right beside them. But the reality is that the searches are all over the place and often wrong or incomplete or ill-informed. I can't tell you how many times I've researched something where the sources they cite on that Google page are like genericfarminfo.com, and that site is just kind of regurgitating info from more genericfarminginfo.com. Take one search I did researching for this episode. The search was, quote, what happens to bare fallow soil during winter, end quote. I wanted to make sure I covered all of the issues, but also wanted to see if there was any new nerdy details I could dig up. At first, the Google AI response told me that, quote, fallowing is a farming technique where arable land is left unsown for one or more vegetative cycles. The goal of fallowing is to allow the land to recover, store organic matter, retain moisture, and disrupt pest life cycles, and soil-borne pathogens. While fallowing can help maintain soil fertility, achieve high crop yields, and support biodiversity, it can decrease income in the short term, end quote. 
Okay, well, that's not exactly accurate to bear fallowing unless someone is leaving wild plants to grow in their fallow. So I thought, what if we stick the word study on the end of that same search, i.e., quote, what happens to bear fallow soil during winter study? The AI overview I received this time read, quote, during winter bare fallow, soil experiences significant degradation, including a decrease in soil organic matter, available nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus, and microbial activity, leading to potential issues like increased erosion, altered soil structure, and a higher susceptibility to disease pathogens due to the lack of plant cover and reduced biological activity, and end quote. So effectively, I put the word study in there and got pretty much the exact opposite answer, or more precisely, the word study made the AI model recognize the word bear, which gave me a better response. As I said at the top of this segment, one helpful thing about these new AI-generated search results is that the studies that the search engine finds are right there, and you can determine if they are helpful, which they can be. So at least the citations are worthwhile, even if the summaries are not. But in that first search, without the words, not only did it not answer the actual query, the citations were as follows. Wikipedia, fine. High Plains Journal, which I'm sure is a great publication, but not a scientific journal. Then another citation was retipster.com, which RE stands for real estate. Then it does have two research studies in there, both on soil temperature, one of which is from 2004. By contrast, for the other query, I searched with the word study inserted, where the answer actually answered bare fallow. That AI answer cited 10, 10 studies, and then three more mass studies. So it took a lot more research into account and got a much more accurate and helpful answer. So what is my point? Uh, I guess my point is that AI is significantly faster at generating answers to questions, but, but because they don't automatically take the best route to answering said question with all the available information, they are also just faster at getting stuff wrong than us. So that's neat. Now, I know someone is going to point out that the better and more thorough your prompt, the more accurate the information is going to be. Cool, fine, but the average person is not going to go through all that. Look at the citations and then follow the links and question whether the sources are actual researchers or at very least credible journalists or journals, or they're going to keep switching the prompt until they get the desired answer because confirmation bias, the human inclination to reject information that runs counter to our worldview and accept that which confirms it, basically runs the world right now, is a powerful beast. Once someone gets the result they want, they are going to accept that as the result. And because it's an AI model with all the information in the world at its proverbial fingertips, how could it be wrong? So if there's someone who wants to just leave their soil or hundreds of acres completely bare over the winter, the AI models are not necessarily going to talk them out of it. Copy paste just about anything else we want to believe. That way, I guess I kind of miss the old old Google. Uh, I'd rather have just the citations without the overview. I'd rather not have to insert the word study for the search engine to look at as many studies as possible to provide accurate information for the question I asked. I'd definitely rather know that people are getting accurate guidance and not just whatever information they want to get. These models will get better, no doubt, but it will be a wild ride to get there. Maybe a more simplified lesson is just add the word study to everything. What's the weather like today, study? Yeah, I guess that's your Messy Monday. I'm going to wrap it up there and go be cynical away from a microphone for a while. As always, let me know what I got right or wrong or anywhere in between. Shout out to Willie Breeding for the theme music and to my team at No-Till Growers for their support. Pick up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook or pre-order a copy of The Seed Farmer by Dan Breezebois to support our work at notillgrowers.com. As always, we will wrap it up with shout outs to our amazing Patreon members at patreon.com slash notillgrowers where... At a certain level, or if you just bump up from one level to another, or if you just sign up in the month of October, we'll shout you out on the show. So big shout outs today to D Moon, Colin Dieter, Gabriel Lopez Carrier, Patrick Weinert, Nate Hale, Melisa Bach. Melisa? Melisa Bach. That's awesome. Great name. Joanna. Sherman? Schnurman? Schnurman. I think that's right. Tomer Rockman. Oh man, this list. Jamie. Jamie, I'm gonna I'm gonna try here. Jamie Wynat? Wynance? Jamie Wynance? Wayne Lula and Michael Larkin. Wind in the Willows. 
and Susan. I love that we have lots of Susans who are just Susan, who don't have a last name on there. Also, I love the names today because they there there's so many of those novelistic ones like Colin Dieter and Melisa Bach. Those are, I mean, can you get any better than this would be, I feel like if this was a novel, it would be about a, a band, like a, a, like a small town band headed by, probably by D-Moon, right? And they uh, make it out and, and they get discovered, but they have to decide if they want to stay a small, small band or they have to, to deal with all the fame. Yeah, we'll call it Susan. It's awesome. It's great. Love it, you guys. Big thanks to whoever supports us in whatever way that you can. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for watching or listening.